very, very lucky to also have Gina with us this evening. And like, like Gary said, let's just jump right into it. I've got a fire hose of information I'm going to give you. Please take notes. And if we can't answer your questions tonight on the call, no problem. Uh, we can set up after the call a complimentary consultation so you can get a one-on-one -on -one with one of us to get all of your questions answered. I'm a licensed financial advisor, real estate investor. In one three-year period of time, I bought, rehabbed, and flipped over 160 properties, resulting in over $92, or $92 million worth of real estate transactions, business consultant, speaker, as well as author. And let's, there we go. So if you have in excess of $100,000 worth of assets, you definitely are in the right place. Uh, we do have a funding program. Uh, we can talk about that at some future point. Uh, there is a 0% APR component to uh, one of our funding solutions, but I'm gonna skip past the rest of these funding slides if you don't mind, so we can get right to the meat of tonight's uh, discussion. Uh, just when you think everything you've worked so hard for is going great, just like that, you can lose it all. And I'm sure that everyone who's on this call, if you're a seasoned real estate investor, you know another real estate investor, if not yourself, who's gotten themselves into some uh, serious uh, problems because they got litigated against. Uh, and it's just an unfortunate reality that we all are subjugated to here in the United States. Uh, our trust, the Titanium Vault Asset Protection Trust, is the absolute perfect solution. And we're going to show you how and why as we move through the pre sale So a building block. Well, what's a trust? Well, it's a contract. It's a contract between the grantor, the trustee, and the beneficiaries. Uh, it's your rule book. Or the government will take control. You do have a choice. There are two common types of trusts. Uh, death trusts, better known as testamentary trusts, created in a will. They do not exist while alive, and they do require probate, which is a court proceeding. Now, I'll quickly tell you a probate story. Uh, probate story is I myself was a small uh, benefactor in a, uh, an estate, and that estate, because it went through probate, was 15 years in probate. And I have seen cases where the courts, i.e. the trustees of the estate, have taken up to 45% of the estate to settle the estate. So probate's not anything that any of us ever want to go through, and there are options. Then there are living trusts. They exist during your life. They do avoid probate, whether they are revocable or irrevocable. Our trust absolutely has a component so that you will not get into or have to be subjugated to uh, probate. So let's talk about the two classifications, revocable and irrevocable. By design, revocable trusts, unfortunately, cannot, do not, will not offer asset protection. Now, many people that are on the call do have a trust, uh, and it's either a living trust or a living will, which is really one and the same. Uh, they are grantor revocable trusts by nature, and therefore, because they fall in that revocable category, they cannot offer asset protection. Conversely, uh, our trust is an irrevocable trust, and therefore, it does offer asset protection. Not that all irrevocable trusts do, but ours is a specialized type of irrevocable trust. Now, one of the questions that comes up at that juncture is, well, it's irrevocable. That means that everything has to be decided today, not the case. Uh, our trust is highly modifiable. So let's say you want to change a trustee, even if you're the trustee, or you want to appoint additional trustees, or you want to change a beneficiary at any time for any reason, you can at the stroke of a pen. Frankly, I'll take the uh, really wild idea that you decided that you wanted to take all the assets that you sold to the trust and get them back because you didn't want to move forward with the trust. Now, we've never had a client that, that went down that road, but just to prove the point, you could do that. The only thing that's irrevocable is the shell of the trust. So 
the irrevocability only works for you, never against you, and it's it's a really good thing in our trust. So let's go through kind of a checklist here of what our trust is all about and what it's not all about. First of all, we do have the ability to eliminate capital gains. And as you can see in the columns here, a C or an S or an LLC, a, somebody who has a holding company, a land trust and or a living will. Uh, we have the ability to defer income tax. We have the ability because uh, we absolutely can avoid the uh, uh, if you will, the implementation of uh, uh, lawsuits, because when a potential litigating attorney becomes aware of the fact that, that you have a trust, likely they're going to uh, fold up tent and leave because they know that they're not going to get anything. Uh, we do have the ability to avoid liens, judgments, uh, reaching the businesses. There is no probate. Uh, there's avoidance of gift tax, avoidance of estate tax, ensuring the beneficiaries that assets are transferred. Uh, it is a multi-generational trust by design uh, for your heirs, and there are no annual fees. So that's a, a 2,000 foot flyover of what the trust is all about versus the other potential ways that you might hold your properties and other assets. Corporations and LLC, I call this the big fallacy about them being able to protect you because they really do not. And I'll illustrate why. It's easy to pierce the corporate veil. Now, most of the investors that are on this call, if you're like all the other investors that I talk to on a daily, <laughs> monthly basis, uh, you are either a solopreneur or a partnerpreneur. And it might be your wife or it might be an external partner. In any event, you're considered to be what's called a tightly held entity. And unfortunately, tightly held entities are very easy to blow up and pierce the corporate veil. The usual argument is alter ego. Uh, and the alter ego can be a result of insufficient corporate separateness. Really what they're saying is that, is that you are acting as the puppeteer and you're also acting as the marionette there's invisible strings and you're controlling you. And frankly, it's a winning argument because it's, it's really true. Uh, I'll show you in a moment a Wake Forest study. Uh, these are all things that can also uh, come into play to, to be alleged and potentially proven as alter uh, ego, which would pierce the corporate veil. Now the Wake Forest story, uh, study that I wanted to reference is a study that showed that in 39 plus percent of the time at the state, 41 plus percent of the time at the federal level, when alleged, they were able to pierce the corporate veil utilizing alter ego. So this is not something that I would ever wanna take a chance at when you're almost at a 50-50 odds on given that if somebody's gonna try and attack your C, your S or your LLC, they're gonna be able to get to you. Uh, you may not have heard about it. Reverse piercing is a, a newer kid on the block, yet it's a very powerful and potentially painful event. It's when a lawsuit against you personally can allow the plaintiff to recover damages by reverse piercing the corporate veil, allowing them to reach the assets in your business entity as well as your personal assets. Closely held entities are at high risk. So let's just say you get into a car accident or you get in, uh, that's a good example, let's just use that. Uh, and you transcend all the liability limits that you have in your policy, they then could come after your business that's in a CNS or an LLC and pierce the corporate veil for satisfaction. Not a pretty day. Entity stacking, I know that this is a very popular strategy where you may uh, reside in California you may have properties in the Rust Belt. Matter of fact, I'm sure a lot of you do because I saw uh, the poll that was going on earlier and a lot of you are interested in and, and currently do invest out of state. And then you get a LLC, uh, which is the preferred uh, vehicle, right? And it's a holding company either in Wyoming or Nevada. Well, that in and of itself could also be problematic because of course you need one LLC for each one, you need a holding company and you could be opening your, uh, yourself to additional taxation. Matter of fact, for each entity that you didn't do what's called a foreign filed LLC in California because that's the state in which you reside, 
you could be up for a $12,000 annual fine. Not pretty. Many people are not aware of this. They, they don't have the foreign filed entities, they, but they do have the holding company and they do have uh, LLCs maybe in Michigan or Iowa or where, wherever they have the property. But that's not the complete picture and that's not operating in compliance. So let's talk about what our trust is. It has many, many different components, but several of the components that we're gonna focus in on on this evening's call are the fact that it is and has its roots in the dynasty. It's a dynasty trust. It's a non-grantor. It's an irrevocable, discretionary, complex, and it's also a spendthrift trust. So it's all of these things, and there's a unique way that it's put together that gave us, which we will discuss again coming up, uh, 58 copyrights. Now, one of the things that is shocking is the fact that you could have filial responsibilities coming, knocking on your bank account door. So the story is, here's a guy in Philadelphia, mom gets ill, she gets into a bad, or, or mom gets into a bad traffic accident, and it is uh, convalescing for six months uh, in a hospital, racking up a $93,000 uh, bill. She after she was ill, after her illness and, and she got better, she was released from the hospital and they tried to get satisfaction, i.e. pay her bill. She couldn't afford to pay it. Uh, and not like usual where the hospital wrote off the bill, uh, they decided because they couldn't get collection that they were going to institute the Filial Responsibilities Act. And what they did was they went to the son's bank account and seized the $93,000. Now, this is crazy stuff, but it does exist. And he thought it was crazy. And if you study this case, you will find that he fought this all the way up to the Supreme Court of Philadelphia, where he promptly lost. So the time, the money, I mean, it's horrible. Now, obviously, if he would have had a trust, and he, we, he would have been coached and would have been one of our clients, everything would have been in trust except for a couple of thousand dollars in what I call an incidental account for his personal food, his personal fun and, and clothing and such. Statistically, the number one uh, problem with people are slip and falls. And statistically, 33% of the people that are out there just walking around are gonna get sued. Two out of three, if you're a uh, pra practicing surgeon, and frankly, from the studies that I've done, about 50% of all real estate investors will get sued at one time or another. 109,000 lawsuits filed every day. Average business lawsuit is a staggering $72,500. And there's 91,000 PI lawyers all out there, all looking to put new cases uh, to work for them so that they can have more food on their plate. Uh, again, the number one problem is slip and falls. 25,000 of those happen each and every day. Uh, this slide articulates the fact that this guy got sued uh, by his contractor. The contractor was not doing work to code, but the flip side of this was he had to pay out $150,000 for uh, this case. Now, if he would have had one of our trusts, this could have never come to bear. Now, a lot of people say, no problem, I'm covered. Uh, matter of fact, I'm, I'm covered because I have liability insurance. And on top of that, I have a, an umbrella and I have a million plus dollar umbrella. And I absolutely tell people uh, that having insurance is great, but it's not the end all cure all be all. I'll use the McDonald's case as an example. You may have heard about the hot coffee spill where the lady got spilled with the hot coffee that was at McDonald's. She got a $3 million award. But the part that you probably didn't hear is the fact that $2.7 million of the $3 million award was in punitive damages. And I've never seen punitive damages covered on any umbrella policy. So sometimes we think we're insured, we think we're covered, then the disaster happens and we find out that uh, 
uh, we really do not have the coverage that we thought that we had. And this is where a trust steps in to fill the gap that absolutely can protect you because they cannot get a lien, a judgment, or an award that they can execute against a properly constructed trust. Asbestos claims, lead-based paint, you've seen it all if you guys are doing rehabbing and, and owning properties. Uh, toxic mold, this is a case where Kellen Gorman received $13 million. Uh, it's, it's out there, guys. Then there's the possibility also of being classified as a dealer rather than a real estate investor. Now, the IRS says that the difference between dealer and investor is simply this. If you bought a property with the intent to make a profit, well, I, I certainly, when I buy properties, I always intend to make a profit. And therefore, you can see it's a very thin line. Uh, unfortunately, if you were to get classified as a dealer, uh, it would be a very, very ugly event because now you're talking about, instead of capital gains treatment, ordinary income, you're talking about uh, self-employment taxes of 15.3%, Medicare surtax, alternative minimum tax, and by the time you're said and done, over 50% of your payday could be eroded from the various taxes that you have to incur. Uh, you also, get precluded from doing other types of exit strategies and or using self-directed IRAs, 1031, so on and so forth. So it's ugly, that's the bottom line. And if you've got a trust, you can never be construed as a dealer because you will be conveying and selling your assets to the trust. Therefore, you don't own the houses that would be the case that if you were being accused of being a dealer. So our trust is, uh, subject to tax liens and levies issued against beneficiaries. It's never subject. It, what, this is what our trust is not. Divorce, alimony, child support, creditors, governmental agencies, or third-party claims. It's also not subject to court's jurisdiction to turn over orders except for fraudulent conveyance. If somebody fraudulently conveyed uh, a, got a trust, yes, they could then uh, overturn the trust. But guys, we don't do that. We don't set people up uh, where there's going to be potential problems. Properties and assets cannot be seized. Property and assets held by a properly constructed trust cannot be seized. As I said earlier, further the trustee, uh, trustee or trustees and or the beneficiaries are not liable for the de debts that the trust might create. So you're never on the hook for anything, which is another great plus. Interesting fact. In all states, whether they're C's, S's, or LLC's, uh, every single state recognizes those as the equivalent of a person, which is why uh, in any state, you could get hauled into court because they are recognized as the equivalent of a person, even if you have an entity. Now, conversely, because our con we have a contractual uh, trust as opposed to a statutory trust. And because it's a specialized type of contract, you cannot be sued. And again, they will have to throw the case out unless they could prove fraudulent conveyance, in which case at that point, if they could prove fraudulent conveyance, uh, then they could hear the case. Let me tell you about uh, one of the, our clients, his name's Matt. Matt had a 17 year old son at the time that he got into a very bad traffic accident. That is Matt's son. Matt was getting harassing calls from the potential litigating attorney. And he was talking about seven figure lawsuit type harassing. So Matt, during this process, called up the litigating attorney informed him about the fact that he had our specialized type of trust. And what do you know, he never heard from the attorney again. The attorney ended up directing his efforts to the policy, the underlying policy, which he did get reciprocity from, but it did not get out of hand. What a time suck, 
what a mental drain it would have been if he would have gotten embroiled and sucked into this case, which didn't happen because the guy went away because he knew he wasn't going to get anything from Matt. So let's talk about Prop 19 in California. What's the impact of Prop 19? Well, you can only transfer your home to your children uh, and or grandchildren without reassessment if they live in the home. Uh, that's the upshot of Prop 19, which goes into effect on February 16th. We do have a workaround, guys. Uh, zero, if you transfer any investment properties to your children, they will be reassessed. That is what's going on. The solution is, as long as the beneficial interest chain, if you will, does not change, there is no reassessment. So when you sell your properties to the trust, you will be the beneficiary of the trust so that no reassessment occurs. This is huge. I cannot stress to you how many calls we've had in the last several weeks. Uh, all day long, the phone is ringing at the office about what can I do? Is there anything that can be done about Prop 19? Uh, I've got a kid, I've got several children, uh, and the reassessments because my, I bought my property at 200,000 and it's worth a million dollars or uh, so on and so forth. And I have multiple other properties. So this is our, our strategy, our proprietary copyrighted trust is absolutely a Prop 19 killer uh, in the way that we work it, the way that it gets set up and the way that it gets implemented. In a time of transition, I think th this is very timely. I, I created this slide uh, actually earlier today. Uh, what will the administration, the new administration do? What will they do to, well, first of all, uh, this is what I have heard. I don't know what you have heard, uh, but what I have heard is that there may be as much as a 40% capital gains in our future there may be a lowering of the $11,700,000 this year cap on estate taxes down to as low as a million. And I know that may sound absurd to go from 11 million to 1 million, but uh, for those of you who might be a little bit uh, longer in the tooth, uh, you'll remember that back in 1996, the estate tax cap was $600,000. So when we look at it that way, the million dollar cap is really not that out of line. Uh, we've heard that there may be a significant increase in several of the tax brackets. We've also heard that there may be a lowering or even an elimination of mortgage interest deductions. I don't know, I don't have a crystal ball all I know is, is this, none of these things would, will, or do affect our trust. Our trust has been around for decades and many, many different presidencies and, and such, and there has not been and will not be change. We do have the ability to legally reduce taxes, and now we're going to spend several minutes talking about that. We utilize our one-of-a-kind registered copyrighted trust to defer taxes legally per IRS trust code. The trust document is written to defer and minimize income and estate taxes in most cases between 78 and 97%. Now, I want to parse that down a little bit. If you have an active business income, an active business would not be the real estate business. Lease and rental income, uh, uh, if you will, capital gains, that's all passive income. Uh, so if you get an active business, doctor, lawyer, dentist, CPA, maybe own a car wash, whatever, then we're looking at roughly 78 to 85% annual mitigation where we defer the rest of that tax burden out in perpetuity. We'll discuss that, what that term means in just a moment. On your passive income, 
lease and rents, uh, you're looking at a 100% deferral. So there may be some cost averaging, or I should say uh, tax averaging uh, done where you end up with somewhere in the middle. And that's why we like to use this range. We need to drill down and have uh, a discussion with you to see exactly where that's gonna fall. There is zero gray area and there's zero capital gains until the trust distributes. So let's discuss the distribution provision that's uh, baked into each trust. The trust distributes in concert with the laws of perpetuity. The brief overview of that is you have passed away. All of your beneficiaries have passed away. All of your beneficiaries' heirs have passed away. And then a period of 21 years ensues. And at the end of the 21st year, there is an automatic distribution provision in the trust, which really becomes academic because at the time of distribution and our trust as all trusts need to have a means to an end and that's the end. At the time of distribution, everyone remotely connected with the family or the family tree has gone to seed and they do not exist. So when, they're, when the liability comes due, if there is a liability and the estate passes to the IRS, who cares? Everybody's gone. So really it becomes academic. And this of course was done by design through the genius of the creation of the trust itself. The way our trust operates, once we work with you and you understand the uh, principles of the trust and, the, and, and how to work within the uh, trust guidelines, which are very, very easy, it actually simplifies the accounting process and people consistently tell us, wow, I had no idea that it was this easy and simple to be able to use and maintain on an ongoing basis. Now, sometimes people have a tough time wrapping their head around this deferral in perpetuity. But let me tell you that there was an article which you can research. This is a reprint from the uh, uh, 2014 article about the Kennedys in Forbes magazine, how the billion dollar Kennedy, Kennedy family fortune defies death and taxes. And it said capital gains taxes could potentially be deferred for forever. So this notion of long-term deferral on taxes is not new to the very, very rich and elite that have these types of specialized trusts and they've been around for generations and generations and generations and many, many administrations. And frankly, the tax code that we uh, utilize uh, goes all the way back to the beginning of when the tax code came into being. So this is a long standing tradition that's not about to change. Another article that you could also reference from Forbes uh, magazine a couple of years later really talks about the Rockefeller family and Standard Oil and Trust and how they attribute much of the wealth uh, that has maintained itself intact due to the fact that they had uh, and they have multiple trusts. So again, food for thought. Our trust again is built upon the precepts of the types of trust that the Rockefellers and the Kennedys have, which is a uh, rooted in a dynasty trust, which again is part of the underpinnings of our trust. We believe in full transparency, uh, whether it's a business income tax return, a trust return, a personal income tax return. Uh, I will say that none of the tax professionals that we work with, having prepared countless thousands of returns over the years that we've had our trust, we've been in a zero audit position, which is admirable to say the least. Uh, tax avoidance is legal. Tax evasion is illegal. Let's show you examples of both. First of all, let's talk briefly about the Special Agents Handbook 412, the IRS handbook, and it states any attempt to reduce, minimize, or alleviate taxes by legitimate means is permissible. 
couple legal case rulings. In the Edison case, it ruled that persons may adopt any lawful means for the lessening of the burden of income taxes. And in the Weeks versus Sibley case, the courts ruled that a spendthrift trust organization is not illegal, even if formed for the express purpose of reducing or deferring taxes. Now, I love to talk about Bezos and his $11 billion in profit and his $160 million refund check that he got from the IRS. And also of note, 60 of the largest companies in the USA paid zero on the pre-tax income of the staggering amount of $79 billion. Why do I mention this? Because I attribute this to both having good lawyers on staff and good tax advice. And we do too. We do too, to certainly a lesser, a, a, on a smaller scale, but nonetheless, we do too. Let's talk briefly about the history. We have 58 copyrights granted going back to 1999. Uh, the trust came into existence in 1996. We have over 39,000 trust instruments out there designed by a collaboration of experts that we have on our team and the payment of taxes is deferred until sometime in the future when the trust assets are distributed. We already covered that, so you know the answer on when the distribution provision kicks in. The trust have two primary purposes, that of both asset protection as well as tax mitigation whenever possible. We're in full compliance with all trust laws, Scott on Trust, the UTC, the Restatement Third of Trusts, and we conform to all contract trusts and tax laws in all 50 states. What makes our trust unique? Based upon the fact that our 58 copyrights, they have a very unique way in which they interplay, which gives our, strength, our, our trust the unique strength uh, that it absolutely has that nobody else can copy or duplicate, otherwise uh, they will get litigated against. Uh, we've got the irrevocability clause, the non-grantor complex discretionary and the spendthrift provision. I'm going to key in on a couple of the important ones. Uh, likely you'd be the trustee and likely you'd also be the uh, overseer or the compliant called the compliance overseer of the trust as well. The spendthrift provision is, is an important one. It's a critical element of the document in, in that there's never been a properly constructed spendthrift trust corpus that's been able to be penetrated to reach the assets of the corpus. And again, there's never been a properly constructed spendthrift trust overturned. Now, if there was fraudulent conveyance, all bets of course are off. Tax reduction strategy or copyrighted trusts are designed for the benefit of the beneficiary or beneficiaries. Beneficiary expenses are paid directly from a bank account to a third party. Those are considered trust expenses and monies paid to beneficiaries directly are considered to be taxable distributions. So let me give you an example. Let's just say you've got two 18 year old kids. One you wanna buy a car for, the other one you wanna pay for their college tuition. Well, you could uh, get them those uh, uh, items one of two ways. They could either be a, a trust expense or they could be a taxable distribution. So let's just say that you wrote out one of your kids a check for $25,000 for their college tuition, told them to put it in their bank account and then go down to the office of admissions and pay for their tuition. Well, if you did that, which likely you wouldn't anyhow, but if you did that, that would be considered absolutely a taxable distribution to your beneficiary, i.e. to one of your kids. So rather, you would do what you probably do in the first place, which is you would just pay the Office of Admissions directly out of the trust bank account and voila, now you've got a trust expense. Same thing with a car. You can either give your other child a check for the uh, car for say 20, the same $25,000, it was a $25,000 uh, car and tell them to put it in their bank account and go down and buy the car or tell them to go down to the, uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the car lot, pick out the car that they want 
and give you a call and you'll just send over a check or you'll come down and write the check in person right out of the account. In which case, again, you have created a trust expense rather than a taxable distribution. Now, one of the things that we have is we've got on our staff a number of people that work in different areas one of which is the tax department. And you will, be, you, if you decide to move forward, you'll be assigned to one of our tax professionals. Heck, we even have uh, on our team uh, currently enroll, enrolled agents with the IRS that do tax returns and, and do tax uh, coaching with our clients. Point is, is this, uh, you're going to be assigned to one of the tax professionals and you get unlimited consulting throughout the end of the calendar year till December 31st, 2021. And you'll also get your 1040 and your 1041, which is the trust return uh, that will be completed as a part and parcel to our service. You'll also get assigned to one of our implementation experts for doing things such as the conveyances and, and getting everything into the trust and understanding the very simple and easy, as discussed earlier, uh, paperwork um, that, uh, that you will have as a part of your trust. Now, I will tell you, and I will commit to you, that because you're on this call and because Gene is on this call and because Gene is the head of that department, uh, that should you decide to move forward, that everyone that's on this call will be directly assigned to Gina, even though she's the head of the department, she also does have an active caseload. She will be your implementation strategist. So there's some really good news for you. Again, this kind of details out what we were just talking about, expense versus distribution. This is all possible because of IRS Rule 643, which states that the trustee has the sole authority to designate income as extraordinary dividends or taxable stock dividends, and that it is paid to the corpus of the trust it is not subject to distribution. It is not income to the trust. So what does that mean? Well, let's talk about other trust expenses that can all go and be rolled into the trust. I like to focus on the one three from the bottom your personal home. Many of you own a home. And if you don't own a home and you're renting a home, uh, all you need to do is just change uh, the rental agreement uh, to uh, the trust. And then you can also get some great, great trust expenses. But let's talk about your personal home, saying that you own a home. Now, normally, the only thing that you can write off would be the interest portion of the mortgage uh, of the mortgage payment, and that's where it starts, and that's where it stops. And who knows where that may end up during the current administration. However, with our uh, proprietary copyrighted trust, you have a much wider corridor of legitimate trust expenses. So let's give you some examples. First of all, all of your utility bills, including your cable bill your lawn maintenance person, your pool person, uh, the entire mortgage payment, um, a domestic, if somebody comes in and cleans the property, uh, any and all uh, repairs and replacement of furnishings and uh, renovations. You may wanna do a, a complete remodel for a couple of hundred thousand dollars. And yes, that would be a viable uh, trust expense. And as we go through this list, as you can see, and you look at the middle column, it's pretty much all goose eggs versus when we talk about things like room and board at college. Heck, it's not just room and board at college. If you've got younger kids, preschool uh, fees that you may pay, and some of those are ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year or more. Uh, uh, undergraduate, high school, private schools, uh, graduate and postgraduate, all falls into it being trust expensable items. Heck, uh, even taking trips to museums, say if you want to go to New York, I know you don't want to go now because of COVID, but uh, post COVID, when we all start traveling again, uh, that would be 
absolutely a legitimate trust expense. So the list goes on and on. This is just a partial list and the corridor is really wide and really deep. How do I fund the trust? Well, you sell your assets to the trust through a notarized bill of sale and you selling at basis. Therefore, you're not creating, you're not going to have a step up in basis. You're not creating a taxable event. Hard assets such as equipment and computers, also intellectual property if you have it. Websites, handbooks, copyrights, trademarks, customer lists, et cetera, et cetera. Now the assets are owned by the trust and any asset can be leased back to an entity. How do I fund the trust? Well, you have lease and rental income from properties or businesses, and you can quit claim or warranty deed assets the property or uh, of the property to the trust. Now you've got, upon that happening, rental and lease, lease income flowing directly to the trust. Now, you, you can also continue to have them pay it to an existing LLC. I know that's a question that's going to come up and, and, and work a operating agreement, which we can discuss uh, when we open it up. Bottom line there is you can then sweep that account and move those monies into the trust so they're safe haven because if as long as it's in the trust bank account in the event of suit, you are absolutely protected from liens, levies, or judgments. Zero capital gains when the property is sold. Now, this is huge. Uh, we are the anti-1031 exchange company, and I'll, I'll jump into that in a little more depth in just a moment. You have the ability to expense all interest payments related to assets. So how do you get money out of the trust? Well, once the assets are sold to the trust, there's going to be the other side of the equation, which is you're going to be the recipient of a demand note for reasonable valuation of the assets that you sold, whether it's your coin collection, your stamp collection, jewelry, uh, fine art, cars, certainly properties, apartment buildings, whatever, it all goes into the trust. Now, the question sometimes comes up, well, what if I don't want to sell an asset to the trust? Well, you don't need to. Nobody said you had to. It's not an absolute, but I always like to pose the, the question coming back the other direction. Why wouldn't you? Because you're going to be getting the tax advantages and you're also going to be having that bulletproof asset protection once that asset is owned by the trust. So, Let's talk about the demand note for a moment. Let's say you sell your assets to the trust uh, for their value. Maybe it's a million, maybe it's 5 million, maybe it's 50 million. It makes no difference. We then issue a demand note in the amount, uh, or I should say, you can then issue a demand note at any time and for any reason for any portion of that demand note. Uh, and any monies that you take out from the principal of that demand note, good news, are tax free dollars, tax free dollars. So this is a great way to fund your lifestyle. And actually uh, this car that we're looking at and or representatively the home, the yacht, whatever, uh, this can be, these can be bought from lease and rental income, which would not uh, originally be a part of the demand note uh, because you didn't sell those. This is now new income that's coming in, right? And when that new income uh, comes in on, on the demand note, the only thing then that becomes taxable is if were, you were to use the money in the trust, irrespective of that demand note, which is separate for personal food, personal fund, or personal fashion. So if it's not personal fund, personal food, or personal fashion, it's going to be a legitimate trust expense. And we can go through what the what if scenarios until we're all purple in the face, but we'll always get to the same place. Unless it's personal food, fun or fashion, it's going to be a legitimate trust expense right on down to exotic cars, great homes, uh, uh, yachts, RVs, you name it. Bruce, uh, pardon my interruption. I just want to give you a time check. Yep. We're at 630 and we want to leave a little bit of time. Uh, for Q&A and for some networking. So I'm not sure. Thank you, Gary. I think we're not five more minutes and we're done. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank yep. you very much. I appreciate it. 
So you had the ability to expense trust assets for managing the trust business, pay expenses for beneficiaries such as education, medical maintenance, and support. You have access to trust assets, including, like I said, cars, properties, yachts, and more. And the investment, the actual uh, initial investment in procuring the trust also becomes a trust expense. So there are no seizures on demand notes as assets are sold to the trust. The basis in the assets are added to the demand note of the person selling the asset to the trust. Demand note is never subject to seizures or claims by any court or jurisdiction. This is a case of a guy that I know. Guy gets into a horrible traffic accident in Brentwood, California. He gets a million dollar plus judgment against him. And unfortunately, even though he had an umbrella that covered uh, most of it, he got hit for out of pocket $250,000. And again, this is where we step in. I'm not gonna tell you my $175,000 bad house deal uh, story because I wanna leave time for Q and A. Least we say, if I would have had a trust way back then, I would have never ever have lost $175,000 from a very predatory buyer. So assets and trust, zero capital gains. And I heard that many of you guys took this survey earlier, and I think the number was something like 40% of you are involved in other types of investments, stocks, bonds, crypto, whatever it is. Well, guess what? That's all capital gains, and we have the ability to also, when you uh, start with the trust, eliminate those pursuant to 643A3 of the Internal Revenue Code ser uh, Service. Crypto, currency trading, Bitcoin, selling assets to another trust, real estate acquisitions, buying selling of your business. Hey, at some point in time, you're gonna wanna check out and that could be a huge lump sum of cash and also accompanying that a huge uh, tax hit from capital gains that we can mitigate. No federal or state probate, no gift tax, zero capital gains on the growth or sale of trust owned assets and the sale of assets to the trust are non-taxable events. We wanted to just re-solidify that. And there is no cap on the amount of assets that could be sold to the trust. And lastly, the IRS code section 643A3 calls out the capital gains and losses or exchanges of capital assets shall be excluded to the extent such gains are allocated to corpus. So like I said, why would you do a 1031 exchange where you could end up with the exchange not going through because when you did your due diligence, the, the property had many, many uh, more repairs that you were than you were bargaining for and therefore you blew out of that transaction and you couldn't find a viable replacement property within that 45 day window. And now you get zapped for the entire taxable amount, ugly. And, or even if you were able to do a 1031 exchange, now you're on what I call the 1031 exchange treadmill, where when you wanna get rid of that property, the only way to get rid of it without incurring the accrued previous tax liability and the new tax liability is to get another property. Well, what if you just want to get off the treadmill and, and relax uh, with our proprietary copyrighted trust? This can get you out of that loop. And yes, we can take your 1031 exchanged properties, put them in the trust and get you out of that loop. So I always like to close with what would your future look like if you were able to control what you earned? Now, one other thing, and that's this. If you would like to have a complimentary consultation, if you would take a picture of this or, or jot this down, please go to platinumtrustgroup.com forward slash VAMS, which is V-A-M-S, or give me a call. That's a direct line. And we'll get you on our list to get a complimentary consultation, either with myself or with Gina. I think we're right on time. And I want to turn it back over uh, to you, Gary, and let's do some Q&A. All right, sounds good. So uh, let's, uh, let's, let's get some questions going. 
It, nobody's got any questions. <laughs> Everyone understood it fully. <laughs> That's a good thing. And that would also be a first. <laughs> so we got one question that came in uh, from Kimberly. Uh, does this tool, I'm assuming the trust, uh, make getting financing on properties more difficult? No. Gina, do you want to take that one? I work with clients every day that are financing properties inside of this trust. Yep. With living trust, it is difficult to get financing for properties in a living trust or in a land trust. But this is a very different kind of trust. It works like a business. So your trust will actually have the same kind of financials your business would have. Profit and loss statements, balance sheets, income statements. And because of that, and because it is a discretionary trust, which allows a trustee to encumber a specific asset with the mortgage, it's not more difficult to get a property financed inside of a trust. Anything else? Yeah, we've got a flood of questions. I'm just kind of going through them and trying to copy them down, but we'll ask one while I'm doing that. Uh, what Gina, are you see, can you see the questions? I can. You can? I can. Oh, well, maybe you might want to grab a couple. I'm just trying to find Kimberly's question so I can go after that. And I'll know I so, a couple of people asked about, um, is this recorded? Yes, this is recorded. And we'll put it up on the APT Capital Group YouTube channel. It'll be up there within a couple of days. Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate that. Uh, we cover a tremendous amount of information in a short period of time. Uh, and uh, doing a review, even prior to your uh, consultation, should you uh, decide that you want to get one, would be a very wise idea. And then you can jot down questions that we can answer on that consultation. So one of the other questions is, so when you sell a property, money stays in the trust. Yes, it does. It's added to corpus. The trustee declares it to be an extraordinary dividend. It's done to eliminate the capital gains taxes. But just because it's in the trust doesn't mean it's not usable. Right. The trust can go out and buy more property. It can invest in stocks, bonds, cryptocurrencies, buy gold, buy silver, literally any kind of investing you would want to do. It can be done inside of the trust and it can eliminate the capital gains taxes. It can defer ordinary income taxes. So that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Yeah. Let's say you sold a property and you didn't want to reinvest it. You wanted to go out and buy yourself a Lamborghini. Guess what? You can do that too. So you really have an awful lot of flexibility. My PhD is in business and business strategy. Yet this is the most flexible business tool I have in my toolbox. I've never found anything as flexible as this. If you already have a trust, is this going to build on that? Do we need to do away with that? Great question. It depends. During the implementation phase, we look at what you've got now, whether this will add to it or whether you do need to do away with it. Whatever is going to serve the client best is really the way that we go about it. I'd like to jump in and, and, and add just one thing for a moment. Sometimes some of the living trusts and, and uh, uh, living wills that we see are so antiquated that we just start from scratch. So that, that's really a one-off situation. And one other thing, uh, Gina was talking about when the capital gains monies goes into the uh, trust. But let's also make sure that we don't forget that's also any other income money that's going into the trust uh, that you can that you can use for trust expenses, including and in most real estate investors cases, all of your lease and rental income. Heck, you might be making 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars on one apartment building if you're in apartments or or. Uh, multiples of that with multiple apartment buildings and or single family residences, of course, at four, five, six, eight thousand dollars a month per uh, SFR. So it's a combination of both along along with uh, the capital gains that you may 
uh, uh, that you may incur and the profit dollars that you may incur if you're liquidating things like Bitcoin or or your stock portfolio or parts of your stock portfolio. So it's not one thing, it's everything. Yeah. Chris, we've had a number of people ask about cost as well as annual costs. Wanna to touch on that for a minute? I do. I did want to I did want to say one other thing. The one thing that we cannot defer on, and I want to be very clear, uh, is any W-2 income that you may have or are receiving uh, in terms of being able to mitigate on that, we cannot, uh, we cannot and do not mitigate on W-2 income. But most investors uh, are either full-time investors or they may have a, a, a side business, uh, in which case that's active income. And as discussed earlier, we can mitigate uh, we can mitigate on that. Uh, so the combination ends up being some very significant numbers. Uh, and what was that follow-up question? I'm sorry, Gina. Elaborate. There's a lot of people asking about costs and estimated oh, expenses yeah, yeah, yeah. on an annual basis. Great. Well, first of all, uh, the let's cover the cost. We have nine different trusts. Uh, we don't know at this particular point whether you need a strictly a beneficial trust, a business trust, which is a two trust trust, a business trust and a beneficial trust, uh, a plus uh, a uh, uh, real estate uh, uh, investor trust, which can be used uh, in specialty types of situations where there are multiple, uh, where there are multiple investors. There's, we, with nine trusts, we want to, uh, through the course of the uh, conversation with you, make a definitive, uh, 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 if you will, consult to give you the right trust that's going to fit your needs. Uh, and therefore, there's, there are multiple different costs. So I'd rather defer on that. Uh, and when we get into the consultation, and once we've uh, definitively uh, come down to where we know the right trust, it's gonna fit your circumstance, then we can talk about the uh, investment dollars to get started. At least we say that it is a trust expense. Uh, the other question is, is what about reoccurring expenses such as, well, what if I buy a new property in a year from now, what's it gonna cost me to get that into the trust and or how much do you have in annual trust fees? The answer is zero and zero. There are no reoccurring expenses there are no ongoing expenses for the trust to, main, to uh, maintain the trust or for trust transactions that you're gonna be doing in the future. Uh, it's a one and done, but I will say this, uh, there is a annual requirement, uh, which is so easy to fulfill, which is that you will be filing a 1041. Uh, along with your 1040. The 1041 is a tax re is a trust tax return. Now the trust tax return, uh, if you were to extrapolate that out and say, well, how much is the trust tax return cost? We have trust um, uh, tax professionals that do trust tax returns for us for 300 bucks. So they're very inexpensive. If we just isolated that one component out. So if somebody said, is there any reoccurring anything at, at, ever yes there is the necessity for the trust tax return but it's really inconsequential in the big picture we do have a ton of questions so i'm hoping to do like a rapid fire here maybe one or two sentence um, sure. answers if we could Go ahead. um do you still take depreciation on the property no need to take depreciation on the property better okay um May you possibly need two trusts or will just one trust cover it all? Well, well Comet asked the that. question. Comet asked the question, could he combine his properties and sister's properties and other people's properties, dad's properties into a single trust? You may want to not do that because you end up living out of the trust. So I have families that come in and we end up getting like five or six trusts for the entire family, including a business trust and some beneficial trusts. Best way to figure that out is to get on our calendar. 
PlatinumTrustGroup.com forward slash VAMS, V-A-M-S, which stands for what I had set up for Gary, which was the Virtual Asset Management Summit. So V-A-M like Mary, S like Sam. Okay. Yep. Can you defer on 1099 income? We absolutely can in most cases. Okay. Anything you can do with RMDs from an inherited IRAs? Oh, don't I wish. Okay, so no. At what valuation of the trust does it make sense to create this type of trust? As Bruce said in one of the very first slides, if you've got $100,000 in assets or if you've got $15,000 a year in income taxes, it makes total sense to sit down and talk to us. It becomes a no-brainer, yeah. So you're saying at the end of a depreciation cycle on a property in this type of trust, you would not have to pay on the income received? Well, there well, would be no depreciation cycle, right? Yeah, the depreciation cycle becomes eliminated the time the institute of trust. So whether at the, you're at the beginning, uh, whether you did whether you did cost segregation, it, it, none of that really it, it matters uh, because going forward from the day that we drive that stake in the ground and we initiate the trust, a hundred percent of all rents and lease income are going to be deferred in perpetuity. So the, de the depreciation schedules and all that, it, it's chucked out the window. Can checking accounts be added to the trust? Absolutely. Absolutely. And will be. Checking accounts, savings accounts, brokerage accounts, crypto wallets, all of it should be added to the trust. Okay. Does this trust need a custodian similar to a self-directed IRA? Nope. No. Can I sell my property to a trust and keep the financing that I currently have? Does my financial institution need to know that I transfer my property to a trust? They do not. I do it every day with clients. Okay. So I'm guessing that's the due on sale clauses, maybe what they're. Yeah. They're talking about the due on sale clauses yeah. and the uh, Garden St. Germain Act of 1982. And yes, we, we have a complete solution there. Okay. Day trading in this type of trust, would we be considered a professional in trading for a fund? Can't be a professional. You're, a you're operating out of a trust. You are not the legal equivalent of a person or an entity. It's a beautiful thing. If an Same thing holds true as the, as the professional or as we called it, the dealer status for, uh, uh, for, for buying and flipping houses where you're doing quick turns. It can't happen. Okay. If an LLC sells a property, how does this pertain to the LLC itself and the individual investors separately? Great question. So the LLC, would it would be a two-step conveyance to get it into the trust. The LLC would sell the property through the owner's equity account at basis to the owner. The owner would then turn around and sell it to the trust at that same price. We do that so that you're not going to have to pay capital gains on selling it to the trust. And it's not considered a bargain sale that way. So it's a wonderful way of getting properties into the trust. Um, does this eliminate taxes for out-of-state fix and flips? Yes. Absolutely. Um, is there any option if we don't? Well, let, let me be clear. I want to yep. back up. Eliminates taxes on capital gains, defers taxes on rent and lease income. I just wanted to parse that out. Yep, perfect. And the trust is only subject to federal income taxes, not state. Is there any option if we don't meet the deadline of February 16th in regards to Prop 19? Yes. So I've been talking a lot about Prop 19 lately. As long as the owner of the property is the beneficiary at the time the property is conveyed to the trust, there is no reassessment. So often it might mean we structure the trust one way until we get the property into the trust. Once they're in the trust, we rearrange the people and the roles that they play. So great question. 
even after February 16th, you can convey to the trust without reassessment. Get on our calendar ASAP so we can put a good strategic plan in place for you. Okay, and we've got eight minutes to take more questions, but before I go forward, if anyone, uh, we've got a lot of people participating in this uh, specific meetup. So obviously people are interested in Prop 19, tax solutions, things like that. You know, Gary and I want to continue to provide amazing value for you guys. This seems like a popular topic. If there's any other topics you want to hear about, please type them in the chat box. We'll make a note of that and uh, have those as our next couple meetups. So go ahead and do that now. If you still have questions, go ahead and ask and we'll go ahead and continue. Um, tough one to answer, but obviously, you know, not everything's perfect. So what are the cons of this trust? You know, I, I get asked this several times a week. I've been living out of the trust for several years. I operate my business out of the trust. I haven't found a con yet. And I wish I could because it's a, it's a question I get asked all the time. Bruce, do you have a better answer? No. I, I, I Come on, guys. My wife lived out of the trust. I, I, I'm not BSing you. Um, the trust, I will say, I will say, the I will trust say tax this. return is reviewed out of the estate division of the IRS. So it reduces your tax audit risk. So that's a plus, not a con. <laughs> I will ahead, say Bruce. this. When I first got my trust, like other people that I, I, I've mm -hmm. heard, it's sort of like going to England and renting a car. You're driving on the other side of the street, you're looking, the, you know, and, and your muscle memory and your concerned, I'll put it that way, trepidatious and and there you are driving. Now, after a couple of days, you're driving in England, it's all good. And frankly, you're very comfortable. And then the weird thing happens. Your trip ends, right? You get on a plane and you come back home. And guess what? You might find yourself driving on the wrong side of the street because you're more attuned in your brain to being back in England. What I'm saying is, is, is this. There is an adjustment period, and it's going to be a little bit out of sync with the way and that you have been doing things in the past. This is one of the reasons that we have our implementation people, where we have things like our chart of accounts, where you're going to be shown exactly how to code things, and or your bookkeeper, if you want to get them on one of the calls, how to how to how to code uh, uh, how to code checks or expenses. But once learned, as I said earlier, and I, I truly meant it, it becomes simpler. But there is that adjustment period, and that can be a little bit uncomfortable. So if anybody's going to ask me, that, that's what I'm going to say. Let's go back to rapid fire. Answer. So we've got five minutes left. Uh, how much in assets did they say you should have to be worth setting up? I remember you just saying $100,000. 100000 and 15000 a year in taxing. Viability. Yeah, and, and and let me let me jump in on that. <clears throat> we have people who have been pretty strategic. Uh, rapid fire, Bruce. Rapid fire. Well, let me say this: the fifteen thousand is not necessarily a solid. If you've got an estate, it's in either or, not not both as a qualifier. You may be paying very low taxes and may have a very high exposure uh, from. Uh, an asset protection standpoint with your estate and or Prop 19 issues, these are all viables and singular reasons to get a trust. Um, what's the legal name of, a tr of the trust? I know you have nine different trusts, but is there one name for this? It's a non-grantor, irrevocable, complex, discretionary, spendthrift dynasty trust that is not self-settled. Can you type that in the chat? That might take you the rest of the time we have. But uh, you got great. it. Um, does the original entity, uh, I believe that says LLC, Seth, uh, S Corp, sole proprietor, become irrelevant once assets are sold to the trust? Can you elaborate on fraudulent conveyance? So it depends. In some cases, we continue to use the LLC, and others, we ditch the LLC. 
If you have partners, we will sometimes keep the LLC. Or if you have active business income, we sometimes keep the LLC. In most cases, if you're the sole owner or you and your spouse are the sole owners and you have real estate holdings in an LLC, then the LLC gets dissolved. Okay. How does this apply to international assets? Oh, you know what? I didn't touch on fraudulent conveyances. Oh, yeah. So fraudulent conveyance is really a complex issue, and it's one that's best dealt with on a a one-on-one consult. If you're going to sign up for a consult, put a note in if you have a fraudulent conveyance issue that you need to talk to Gina. Okay. Uh, How does this apply to international assets? So I have several clients that have international assets and they have them in the trust so that they can protect them. They may or may not have tax benefits for sales of the international assets. I have one client that had a sale of an asset in France and it did help with French taxes, but the trust is designed to help with tax mitigation in the US, but it can help with asset protection anywhere. What do you do if a property is already in a bypass trust? Are we still able to make changes? We have to talk more about your bypass trust, maybe. Probably want to take a look at the at the uh, at the trust and make a determination. Would be would be uh, uh, the easy most expedient thing to do. Okay, and Dr. Gina just put the name of the trust in there. It's at the bottom of the chat, just for anyone who wants to know. Thank you very much. Is the trust only valid until you die? Oh, no, it's a multi-generational trust. By definition, a dynasty trust is one that exists beyond the death of the beneficiary, the beneficiary's heirs. So it is a multi-generational trust. It is designed so that it could continue for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years until 21 years after the death of the last heir to the last beneficiary, this trust continues to exist. All right, we've got one minute. So super rapid fire, one word answers. Can consultation be in Spanish? No. Does your typical client work with your CPAs on staff? Yes. Can you purchase life insurance through it? Can you purchase life insurance through it? Yes. Okay. Not sure if I missed this question. If we transfer a property currently owned in my own name to a trust, will I need to pay transfer taxes? No. No in most states. All right. That's it. I think we may have missed a couple. I apologize. We did get a request to have just a Q&A with you guys later, which Gary and I will talk about. Maybe we can have you back on for like a 30-minute Q&A. Uh, for those yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Record. Um, but thanks everyone for hopping on. We're at the top of the hour. This will be recorded again and put up on our YouTube channel here in a couple of days. I did put the link in the chat, but it's just youtube.com backslash APT Capital Group. Please give these guys a call. They'll definitely help you out and uh, we'll go from there. So thanks everyone for coming on. It's been a sincere pleasure and I, I can't thank you enough for the opportunity to get this timely information out to all you great people. Thanks everyone. Yep. Thank you guys. Bye everybody. Bye-bye. We look forward to speaking with you soon.